to everybody who has joined us today for this session from India, titled Lessons from the Holocaust for India. I'll be comparing this session. My name is Navra Safridi. I am an assistant professor in the Department of History, Presidency University, Kolkata, where I teach a Holocaust-focused postgraduate course. I'm also a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy, New York, and a fellow of the Salzburg Global Holocaust Education and Genocide Prevention Program. I'm joined for this session by a couple of friends. Uh, Saira Mushtaba is an English news anchor with the All India Radio, a Salzburg Global Fellow, and a freelance journalist and translator who has published in a number of leading periodicals in India. Today, she will speak to us about her experience of translating into English, the only Urdu poem on the Holocaust and its significance, given the problem of Holocaust denial in certain sections of the Urdu speaking population. Urdu is the lingua franca of linguistically diverse South Asian Muslims who constitute one third of the global Muslim population. Dr. Nadri Roy is an assistant professor and head of the Department of Performing Arts at Presidency University, Kolkata. He is a formally trained Indian classical vocalist who specializes in Rabindranathir, Nayan, or Tagore's songs. His areas of research include Indian music history, Indian musicology, and Indian classical music pedagogy. He will sing for us today a Bengali song written by Rabindranath Tagore. The song talks about the upliftment of the soul from a dark night and the resurrection of an enlightened soul who makes a journey from darkness to light. All three of us are grateful to Together We Remember for the opportunity to participate in the 24-hour Global Vigil, marking the conclusion of Genocide Awareness Month. I would now request you for a minute to share my screen with you so that I could give a, a small PowerPoint presentation. Now for us, you're able to share screen. Yes, yes. My presentation is titled Lessons from the Holocaust for India. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to present before you an Urdu poem on the Holocaust by the late Anwar Nadeem, followed by its English translation done by my friend Saira Mushtaba. Zindagi o maut ki jadu gari hai zabi par char su pheli hui. Rahate bhi zehmato ke saath hain, mushkilen bhi हौसलों के साथ हैं तीरगी हर गांव की झोली में है रोशनी भी वक्त की मुट्ठी में है इस खराबे के चलन को क्या कहूं एक जरा सी देर का झूठा सुकून फिर इसी जुलमत पदे में जिंदगी है जुनू के सामने बिखरी हुई हर जमाने में कयामत का वजूद खून में नहला गया इंसानियत काश मिल जाती कोई ताबीर भी एक सपना ही रही हकानियत आरजू फिर भी यही है दोस्तों दर्द का ये सिलसिला पैदा ना हो इंग्लिश ट्रांसलेशन डन बाय माय फ्रेंड सायरा मुश्तबा गोज लाइक दिस द मैजिक ऑफ लाइफ एंड डेथ इज स्प्रेड इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस रिलीफ 
comes with tribulations. Troubles come with fortitude. Each footstep is laden with darkness. Light is in the hands of time. What should I comment on the event unfurled? A moment of false comfort. Life again in this torture cell. The day of judgment in every epoch. A bloodbath of humanity. If only one could interpret this nightmare. The only desire that still remains, friends, the series of this pain should never be born again. This poem was published in the trilingual brochure that had texts in Urdu, Hindi, and English of a Holocaust films retrospective held in Lucknow, India in 2009. It was the first ever Holocaust films retrospective in South Asia. The event was significant because of several reasons. It was the first ever films retrospective in South Asia. It ran for 14 days during which 46 films were screened, seen by 4,000 people at the two biggest universities in the area. The event was covered by the local press in Hindi and English, the two official link languages in India. Every screening was followed by a talk or lecture against Holocaust denial by some eminent personality. The event was a rebuttal to a conference held in December 2006 in Tehran with the aim of promoting Holocaust denial. Titled Review of the Holocaust Global Vision, the conference was organized by the Iranian Foreign Ministry's Institute for Political and International Studies and attracted 67 participants from 30 countries, including former Ku Klux Klan leader and Holocaust Denial, denier David Duke, French Holocaust denier Robert Forrison, and officials of the neo Nazi German National Democratic Party, among others. The conference was preceded by a cartoon contest on the Holocaust held by Hamshehri, which, when translated in English, it means fellow citizen, a national Iranian Farsi newspaper in February 2006. 200 cartoons of the 1,200 received from over 60 countries, including cartoons that denied or minimized the Holocaust, were exhibited in August of the same year at the Sabah Art and Cultural Institute in Tehran with sponsorship from the Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. It was not just the timing but also the venue that made the film's retrospective significant. Lucknow is one of the biggest centers of Shia culture in the world with a strong connection to Iran. Although Muslims constitute only 26.36% of the city's total population of 2.8 million, as estimated in 2011, they have made a strong impact on the city's culture. The patronage extended by its Shia Muslim rulers of Iranian origin between the years 1722 and 1858 to intellectual, to intellectual pursuits attracted Shia Muslim scholars from around the world, including the ancestors of Ayatollah Rula Musawi Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic revolution of Iran in 1979. They migrated from Nishapur, Iran to Kintur, district Barabanki, India, adjacent to Lucknow in the late 18th century and stayed there until 1830, when Khomeini's grandfather, Sayyid Ahmed Musawi Hindi, whose period is 1790 to 1869, moved to Iran. He was known as Hindi, which is Farsi and Arabic for Indian, in Iran as he came from India. The Shias of South Asia, specifically Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, maintain strong ties with Iran, where they often go for religious studies and pilgrimage. Among them, there is also a high rate of news consumption, including anti-Semitic propaganda, such as Holocaust denial and slash or minimization disseminated by the Iranian media, print, electronic, and digital, all three 
and translated or dubbed into Urdu and slash or other major languages spoken by them. Considering this, it is not surprising that Lucknow is also a major center of anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic Muslim rhetoric in South Asia. Lucknow has been a hotbed of Muslim politics in India. It served as the headquarters for the All India Muslim League, the political organization that successfully led the movement for the partition of India, creating Pakistan, an independent state for the Muslims of pre-independence India by uniting those areas of British ruled India that had a Muslim majority. It is also home to several highly prominent institutions of Islamic learning, such as Nadwatul Ulama and Farangi Mahal. Alumni of Nadwatul Ulama are found heading Islamic centers across the world. Lucknow also serves as the administrative capital of the most populous state in India, Uttar Pradesh, home to 200 million people. It is the biggest state located inside a country in the world. It is more populous than any country in Africa, Australia, Europe, and South America. The significance of the Urdu language lies in the fact that it is the lingua franca of linguistically diverse South Asian Muslims. The Muslims who live in the countries of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, popularly known by its acronym SARC. They make up almost a third of the global Muslim population. It has also been the language of South Asian Islamic discourse. In the 18th century, it emerged as the language of Indo-Persian Muslim high culture. It is spoken as a first language by nearly 70 million people and as a second language by more than 100 million people, primarily in Pakistan and India. It is the official state language of Pakistan and is also officially recognized in India. The region has produced some of the greatest Islamic thinkers, such as Shah Waliullah, sometimes also spelled Waliullah, whose period is 1702 to 1763, considered one of the progenitors of pan-Islamism. Then there is Muhammad Iqbal, the great poet, Sayyid Abul Ala Maududi, whose period is 1903 to 1979, and Maulana Abul Hassan Ali Hasni Nadwi of Nadwat al Ulama, Lucknow, whose period is 1914 to 1999, all of whom have played a pivotal role in shaping political Islam with global impact. Most of them wrote in Urdu. Anwar Nadim, the poet who wrote this poem, which remains the only Urdu poem on the Holocaust, had read almost nothing about the Holocaust at the secondary level of education, as is the case with most of the students in South Asia. Nazism finds mention in the national, in the Indian national curricula for school education and in the syllabus for the national eligibility test for lectureships in history conducted by the University Grants Commission. However, the mention of the Holocaust is absent in both. Besides, not all books mention Jews as the victims of Nazi rule. Hitler's success is seen as indicating that he possessed specific personal qualities. Reference is made to the fact that he was an impassioned speaker capable of deeply moving his audiences. He's presented as innovative in the sense that he devised a new style of politics by making optimum use of rituals and spectacles for mass mobilization. All the above mentioned alleged qualities of his are mentioned even if he used those in a manipulative manner by the National Council for Educational Research and Training textbook for year nine students from 2006 onwards. Other books present these traits not merely as capabilities but as positive qualities while the Nazi rule is validated in general when it comes to the characterization of Hitler the tone of the text varies from profound condemnation to appreciation and admiration. <clears throat> As a consumer of news provided by the Urdu press, Anwar Nadim had read much that aimed at either denying the Holocaust, minimizing its scale, obfuscating it, or simply reversing it by describing the Jewish Israelis as the present-day Nazis. Even when the Holocaust film's retrospective was taking place in Lucknow, 
for which he wrote the poem I just recited. The Urdu press there published front page stories denying the Holocaust and calling it the biggest hoax of the 20th century with the intention of sabotaging the ongoing event. The articles were largely based on the arguments made by well-known Holocaust deniers such as Arthur R. Woods, David Irving, Harry Elmer Bans, David Hogan, and Paul Rezinia. The Urdu journalists, most, most of whom are Muslims, resort to Holocaust denial because they believe that they can legitimize the state or they can delegitimize the state of Israel by proving that the Holocaust is a big hoax, as it would deprive Israel of what, in their eyes, can be the only justification for its creation and existence. Urdu has a vibrant press, the third largest in India after Hindi and Urdu, both in terms of the number of publications and daily circulation. According to the Registrar of Newspapers for India, there are 1,443 Urdu newspapers, including 929 dailies with a total circulation of 34 million. Nevertheless, the Urdu journalism in its essence is views oriented as its role in molding Muslim public opinion is simply incomparable to the other vernacular press as explained by Arshad Amanullah, a New Delhi based writer and filmmaker. However, Nadeem still had an open mind and was ready to acknowledge the Holocaust as a fact of history when pointed out to him by me. But what is significant now is that the Muslims who till now had either denied the Holocaust or minimized its scale or simply preferred to ignore it as a historical episode and be careful as to never talk about it have lately been seen appropriating its history and terminology in their opposition to the Citizenship Amendment Act. Muslims are opposing, are opposing <clears throat> the Citizenship Amendment Act and the formation of a national register of citizens for the entire country. Government is repeatedly stressing that the two are not interconnected. There are some who are under the delusion that Muslims are so agitated because they do not want the illegal Muslim migrants from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan to be sent back to those countries because of their sympathies for their co-religionists. The fact is that the Muslims are protesting because they fear that if they fail to submit the officially required pre-1971 legacy documents, as was the NRC requirement in Assam, which left out 1.9 million people. Other than the identity documents, such as passport, voter identity card, Aadhaar card, PAN card, driving license, etc., or those that they submit are found to be insufficient to prove their Indian citizenship, they would be sent to detention centers, while those from other religious communities would be spared even if they too fail to submit sufficient documents because the, citizen, the Citizenship Amendment Act clearly states any person belonging to Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi, or Christian community from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or Pakistan who entered into India on or before the 31st day of December 2014 and who has been exempted by the central government by or under clause C of subsection two of section three of the Passport Act 1920, or from the application of the provisions of the Foreigners Act 1946, or any rule or order made there under shall not be treated as illegal migrant for the purpose of this act. As evident, it makes no mention of Muslims. Those stripped of citizenship are particularly vulnerable to genocide. Genocide Watch has already released an alarm for the millions of Muslims in Assam, drawing attention to signs of the early stages of the genocidal process there. To quote Genocide Watch, at the urging of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Hindu nationalist central government, Assam is updating its master list of citizens. Those classified as Indian citizens will receive new Indian identity cards, 
symbolizing their classification. Anyone not on the final citizen list will be presumptively declared a foreigner, subject to statelessness and indefinite detention. Assam's Muslims are especially likely to be excluded from the citizen list as part of a decades long pattern of discrimination. The word foreigners is a common term of dehumanization used to exclude targeted groups from citizenship and the exercise of their fundamental civil and human rights. The Home Minister of India has repeatedly referred to the alleged infiltrators from Bangladesh as termites. Anti-Muslim propaganda has polarized the Assam population Roundups of foreigners are likely to ignite genocidal massacres and a massive refugee crisis. If India imprisons Bengali Muslims in Assam, it will be violating its obligations under the United Nations Refugee Conventions. If it expels them from India, it will be perpetrating forced displacement, a crime against humanity. If genocidal massacres occur, India will violate its obligations to prevent genocide under the genocide convention, unquote. The fears that Muslims have are not baseless, given the fact that even the family of the former president of India, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, a Muslim, failed to make it to the National Register of Citizens, while a Kargil war veteran, Muhammad Sanaullah, has been declared a foreigner and sent to a detention camp. It is almost an existential crisis for Indian Muslims. I'm not a legal expert. I do not wish to get into the debate as to whether the Citizenship Amendment Act is constitutional or not. What I do know as a student of history is that slavery and racial segregation in the US, Holocaust in Germany, and apartheid in South Africa were legal and constitutional at those places. What is legal and constitutional may not necessarily be just and fair. I think it is really important to draw lessons from the Holocaust. It also provides us the distance needed to retain our objectivity so badly needed for drawing lessons for the prevention of mass violence. It would be hard to stay objective when we study any episode of mass violence that happened in India. Conditions that prevail in India today could be seen as warning signs before mass atrocities, such as tension and polarization. The gulf between Hindus and Muslims has greatly increased since the present National Democratic Alliance coalition government came into power at the center in India. There is a proliferation of hate on social media. There is apocalyptic public rhetoric Hindu nationalists have repeatedly accused the Muslims of indulging in love jihad, that is alleged trapping of Hindu girls via allure by Muslims for matrimony leading to their religious conversion and land jihad, that is land grab, and of Hindus being in danger because of the rapidly rising numbers of Muslims in the country. Some have even suggested forced sterilization of Muslims. Another problem is labeling civilian groups as the enemy. Those critical of Hindu nationalists are called pseudo liberals or pseudo secularists by them. Muslims protesting against the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act and the proposed implementation of the exercise for the protection of a national register for citizens at the pan India level are equated by Hindu nationalists with Indian with anti nationals in their discourse. Hindu nationalism is equated with nationalism. Rationalists who have been speaking against superstitions have even been killed in a spate of attacks. There is also the development and deployment of irregular armed forces. Never has the lack of distinction between non-state actors and government authorities been so great, to put it in Christophe Jeffelet's words. These are vigilant groups, Gorakshaks, and there are vigilant groups, Gorakshaks, that is cow protectors, and police mitra, that is volunteers assisting police in its operations during riots, etc. Then there is also the stockpiling of weapons. 
low intensity violence in India is cyclic in nature and has come to be seen as intertwined with India's electoral politics. Scholars have concluded that it is never spontaneous and it and is generally stimulated with political dividends in mind by politicians. Hence, there are groups in the country that are almost always well equipped with weapons which may not necessarily be conventional to perpetrate violence or varying degrees. Then there is also emergency or discriminatory legislation. Its manifestations are the Citizenship Amendment Act and the exercise implemented for the formation of a national register for citizens. Removing moderates from leadership or public service. Instances of TV journalists being compelled to resign when they refuse to confirm. A high court judge being transferred in the middle of the night in spite of the fact that he was on a bench in an ongoing case. And independence of inst institutions stands compromised. There is, is impunity for past crimes. Cow vigilants accused of violence have been felicitated by BJP ministers. BJP ministers accused of hate speech continue to hold their cabinet positions, etc. Rate of conviction of those accused of perpetration of complicity in mass violence stands at dismal 1%. And this is not peculiar to the BJP led National Democratic Alliance coalition government's tenure. Paul R. Brass rightly says, quote, the government of India and the state governments do virtually nothing after a right to prosecute and convict persons suspected of promoting or participating in riots." Unquote. We must remember what the Holocaust survivor and author Primo Levi said. It happened, therefore it can happen again and it can happen everywhere. I conclude with the words of Elie Wiesel, what is your responsibility now that you have seen, now that you know? Each individual must answer that question for himself or herself. Thank you. Now I would like to invite my friend Saira to talk to us about her experience of translating this only Urdu poem on the Holocaust. And what, she, and what she feels as to how this poem is so significant given this uh, tendency among certain sections of Muslims to deny the Holocaust or, or uh, uh, minimize its scale. Over to Saira. Thank, thank you, Navras, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Navras. That was such a wonderful presentation of yours. And uh, in a nutshell, I would say why I'm here, because the the quote that you ended your presentation poses a question to each individual that we have to ask that question to us. And uh, before I move on, I think uh, Navras gave you a very detailed uh, presentation on the demography of Shia Muslims in Lucknow. And well, I am a Shia Muslim. That doesn't mean that uh, my loyalties are with the state of Iran. It's very important, uh, I think, to make uh, distinctions that if my loyalty for example, I'm a practicing Shia Muslim. My loyalty is more towards uh, the family of the Prophet that you know differentiates between Sunnis and Shias. That's the main difference. So when Imam Hussein, the grandson of Prophet, was uh, killed uh, at the hands of a tyrant, he said, whenever you find the truth alone and sad, remember me. That is the sole reason when I remember uh, the Holocaust, and uh, where I criticize uh, tyrants like uh, Hitler and even the present tyrants. So wherever there is a discrimination, wherever there is a genocide, wherever the helpless needs uh, some support, what I can do most is through my art, through my voice, I can express solidarity. And uh, though, uh, uh, for example, as a journalist, I would say, though I do uh, uh, kind of, you can say, appreciate the, some ways of uh, the state of Iran, how it's tackling the Western atrocities or whatever, but I will vehemently always oppose how they deny the Holocaust. And I have always uh, said this, that this is my individual, uh, this thing, because uh, my, uh, my allegiance more, uh, you can say, to Imam Hussein teaches me that we have to stand up with the helpless. And uh, just uh, because I stand with the people uh, who faced so much um, during Holocaust, it's always remember 
uh, it's very important to remember it every year so that it is not repeated again and again in history. And that is the prime reason that uh, my, uh, you can say my solidarity and support is equally with, for, for example, with the, the Muslims who are facing atrocities in India, which Navras has very uh, beautifully pointed out after CAA and NRC, the, the kind of, you know, the statements that were coming in from government leaders. Or internationally, if we talk about even, for example, uh, Palestinians, they are facing a lot. So uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I am expressing solidarity for somebody, then uh, in another way, I will be uh, quiet because uh, that is against what uh, you can say my conscience doesn't allow. And uh, if I talk about um, translating this poem, I was uh, absolutely, uh, apart from the fact that uh, the writer, uh, who, who happens to be Navras's father also, he being such a great uh, writer and poet, but uh, I really appreciate his guts that he actually wrote the only poem on the Holocaust in Urdu. And uh, I was very fortunate that I got the chance to translate it. And uh, not just uh, the, the expression was beautiful, but just the message that it's been, that it being the only poem on the Holocaust in Urdu. I wanted to be a part of that project so that I can show my solidarity to the deprived. And uh, just like I have, um, you know, for example, I would tra translate any poems, for example, on the uh, wherever there is uh, atrocities on a helpless law, be it uh, Palestinians, be it Uyghur Muslims, be it anyone. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, my responsibility. And uh, yes, uh, the Holocaust, unfortunately, in many, uh, you can say, unseen ways, invisible ways, keeps raising its head in all the countries, including India. And uh, right now, obviously, the country is facing a very, very, you can say, severe crisis in terms of COVID and how the government is handling. But apart from that, I hope when all this subsides, the only thing that will emerge is uh, anti-minority sentiment, because that is what these leaders thrive on. Uh, just like uh, Hitler thrived on this anti-Semitic uh, sentiment against the Jews. And uh, it's just beyond my, you can say, I sometimes uh, when I read about the Holocaust, um, I just cannot believe that a person like that existed uh, who can actually send so many innocent people to death and the, the other people are just quiet. But now when I see you know, that this is what uh, this is what is happening throughout the world, um, we are quiet uh, when, uh, when there is atrocity on um, Hindus in Pakistan, the very little Hindus that are left in Pakistan, we are quiet when there are atrocities, when there are lynchings in Muslim, on Muslim, of Muslims in India because they eat beef, apparently, allegedly. And uh, I am totally flabbergasted at, uh, you can say, the atrocities that the Palestinians have to face. So, um, yeah, I mean, people have always, uh, tyrants have always acted like this. And Hitler, his physical death has, uh, we have seen, but he, I think, unfortunately, continues to live in many other manifestations and forms, which uh, we have to counter. We artists, anyone who feels writer, journalist, we have to, uh, through our art, through our expression, we have to express solidarity uh, to the people and speak for them so that uh, the Holocaust is not repeated again. Yes. Um, so, well, thank you so much uh, again for uh, having me here. And uh, again, I would like to thank uh, Navras for giving me the opportunity to translate this poem. And I really look forward to if there is, if there happens to be any other literature in Urdu literature, because I, my portrait is to translate from Urdu literature into English, I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this great talk. Now, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. Nilazri Roy, to sing a song written by Tagore as a tribute to those who perished in the Holocaust. I uh, personally uh, thank this uh, great event and my colleague, Dr. Novis Afridi. And uh, I want to sing uh, one song by Tagore. And I have uh, chosen this song because I believe in the belief of Tagore, in, in peace, in love, and in light. So 
in that context, I want to present the Tagore song, Mono Mahono Gahono Jamini Sheshe. It talks about uh, end of a dark night. That dark night, which, which shows us the dark side and the soul is getting uplifted in love and in life and in light. So I present Mono Mahono Gahono Jamini Sheshe Dile Amare Jagai. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Niradri, for this wonderful performance. We would like to end the session from India by lighting a candle in memory of those who perished during the Holocaust, in the hope that we would be able to draw lessons from the Holocaust and that we renew our resolve to ensure that what happens then does not happen again, neither there in Europe nor anywhere else including India. We must realize that unless the democratic institutions are appreciated, nurtured, and protected, they cannot be sustained. For democracy is fragile, and that silence and indifference to the suffering of others or to the infringement of civil rights in any society can, however, unintentionally perpetuate the problems. The Holocaust could happen only because individuals, organizations, and governments made choices that not only legalized discrimination, but also allowed prejudice, hatred, and ultimately mass murder to occur. It is the responsibility of citizens in any society to identify danger signals and to know when to react to prevent genocide and the steps required. It is with these words that uh, I light a candle on behalf of all my friends here. And I also invite Keel and David and whosoever can join us to do so. I'm joined here by my children, my five-year-old twins, my daughter Chehkar and my son Paham, who also happen to be the grandchildren of the poet who wrote the only Urdu poem on the Holocaust. Chehkar, please come here. Paham, come here. Excuse me, let me switch off the fan. And it is with this that we, the team from India, says goodbye to all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>